Hi, and welcome to Central Life Online. My name is Randy. I'm one of the pastors here at Central Life Church, and we welcome you today to the service that we have planned for you. There's going to be some great music and worship, going to be some great prayer time, and always Pastor Ryan brings a faithful word from the Word of God just for you in order for all of us to take our next step in our growing relationship with Jesus Christ. We encourage you to take advantage of the things that are offered to you here online, like the connection card where you can fill out digitally and let us know what's on your mind. You can also get involved in the chat during the message. You can submit prayer requests then and have a, a live conversation while the teaching goes on. So keep all that in mind and enjoy yourself today. And thanks for being a part of what God has laid on our heart to share with you. Now, there's some things going on at Central Life we want you to know about. And the first one is tomorrow morning, 6.30 a.m., we are having our third prayer gathering during our 21 days of prayer. It's our last week. And so we'll be meeting here live, but we'll also be live streaming that prayer event. So keep that in mind if you can join us on live. But if you feel so led, we would love to tempt you to come and be live with us with some Starbucks coffee that will be waiting for you when you arrive. So keep that in mind. On the 29th of January, we have a praise party. We have so much fun at these praise parties. There is so much joy. There are children here. There are adults here. There is music. There is teaching. There are guests that are going to be here. We have a bunch of church planters that are going to be in the room that night. It's going to be packed out. It's going to be full and it's going to be fun. But here's the good news. It's also going to be live streamed. And so you can watch it all on Friday night, the 29th at 7 p.m. Keep that in mind. And then one last thing this morning before we pray. On the 31st, which is a Sunday, we are taking our Sundays this year that are the fifth Sunday in a month. And January is the first one. There'll be four during the year. And we're turning those Sundays into a serve day event. Here's what's gonna happen. At 9 a.m. at both of our locations, both Oceanside and Cocoa West, we're asking folks to come like they normally would at 9 a.m. and then go out into the community with predetermined projects where we can go out and bless people in the community. There's a whole variety of things that we'll be doing. Now, if you've never downloaded the Serve Day app, that is key because once you get on that app, you can find Central Life Church and all the projects will be listed there. You can sign up for one. So keep that in mind. Here's the other feature. On that morning, if you can't go out into the community, we're turning it into a food drive, just like we did in the spring. And so you can bring your non-perishable goods between 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. on Sunday the 31st to the location you normally attend, and you can drop off non-perishable foods and be a part of this huge event. Thousands of dollars will go out, hundreds of hours of work will be delivered to our community, and we will spread the love of Jesus by acts of kindness. Well, that's a lot that's going on, but that's what a great church does, a healthy church does. It puts faith into action. And we're gonna do that here at Central Life continually through 2021. I'd love to pray with you now for all that God is putting our hand to do and to ask him to bless us now in this online service. Father God, it is such a joy to be part of the family of God. And thank you for calling us into your family and adopting us and giving us the full privileges of children of God. Father, we now anticipate the word of God and the worship that would draw us so close to you and meet every need of our hearts today. We thank you in advance for what you'll do in this time together today. And we bless your holy name. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Sin 
Hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. Hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest thing, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. For Christ alone, Christ alone. Cornerstone for the weak made strong in the Savior's love through the storm. He is Lord, Lord of all. When darkness seems to hide his face. I rest on His unchanging grace In every high and stormy gale My anchor holds within the grave My anchor holds My anchor holds within the grave Chaka. Yeah. 
Well, good morning, church. We are so excited to be with you. Here we are, the middle of January. It's been a great month so far, and I want to welcome all of our church family that's gathered in multiple places, our Oceanside location, our uh, Cocoa West family right here, church online, everybody that's gathered this morning to worship Jesus together, to be together. Let's put our hands together and say, welcome to church, wherever you're coming from. We're so glad that you're with us today. And uh, it's an exciting day to be in God's house. We're in a series called It's Time. And we started with prayer. It's time to pray. And we're in 21 days of prayer and fasting. And tomorrow morning at 6.30 here at our Cocoa West location, we're going to open the doors and we're going to pray together. And I just want you to know, in light of all that's happened over the last several weeks in our country, especially at the, the really at the helm of our nation's leadership and the presidency and the transition that's going to take place this coming week, we are dedicating tomorrow's prayer for our nation. And we're going to lean in, we're going to appeal to God and say, God, we believe that you have a will and you have a purpose and a plan for this nation and and it's to see the church thrive within it and to reach people with the gospel and he is intimately involved in the life of this country and we're going to appeal to God to have his way and we're going to ask for his wisdom about how to move forward so hey come and pray with us with that theme and that, uh, that heart and mind tomorrow morning. But it is, will be our final week of fasting and praying. I hope you're enjoying it so far. You know where to go to get the resources, but um, let's pray together, all right? The second week we talked about peace, and then today we're going to talk about building. It's time to build. It's time to build. And I want to talk to you about that in just a moment because before we open God's word and, and share in some things, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to present to you our 2020 and, and some of the outcomes of our ministry, some of the results of what took place in 2020. Um, I do that every January and love to share some insights. But I will tell you, as, as if I need to tell you, you already know what a strange year it was. It was weird in a lot of ways. And, uh, and like here's an, here's an interesting thing to consider is that our church gathered in person 35 out of 52 weeks last year uh, because of shutdowns and we had a hurricane mix in and we had, we had, we, it was just, it was just odd. It was odd. That's never happened in the history of our church. That's never happened in the history of a lot of churches. And so because of that, just like your family, just like your business, just like your workplace and your children's school, um, everything we normally would have done didn't happen quite the same way. And the way that we would normally track all that was being done and it could happen in pockets and places and moments. And so it's been, a strange, it's been a strange year to even look at the outcomes and the results. What I will tell you is the most important thing we do is lead people into a growing relationship with Jesus. Without Jesus meeting people and hearts surrendered, um, life Life doesn't have value. We need to share the gospel and connect people to that. And it's, it underscores why we do everything else that we do. And I want to share with you today kind of a state of the church, not just central life, but, but the church as a whole across the nation. One of the things I've learned uh, through, through studying the church as a whole, looking at lots of surveys, looking at what happened in the church, I can tell you that, that one out of five churches... Uh, are now in, have closed permanently or in jeopardy of doing so. They're right on the verge of it. That's huge. That's, 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 that's tens of thousands of churches. Somewhere about 65 to 70,000 churches are either closed permanently or on the verge because of what happened in 2020. And I would tell you that's tragic, and yet there are some, probably some moments of it that were necessary. God has a life cycle. We still have hope. We're not depressed about it, but we are watching and we are learning. One of the things I learned through a great mentor and a friend who works with dozens of churches across the country, he said, you know, churches fell into three predominant categories. Uh, they were, number one, they, they did become desperate in 2020. It was like, oh my goodness, I don't know how we're going to survive this. Another third of them got to a place where they realized, I think we're okay, but if we can't go back to what we're used to quickly, then we're really, we might be in trouble. And then the third group actually thrived through 2020. And the third group, um, he mentioned that, that they, had, they had three common denominators within them. 
And as I listened to him kind of dialogue about that and we, we shared with each other, I realized you, Central Life family, you had all three of the common denominators that led to a thriving church in 2020. And I just can give you some insight to that. It's one of the ways that we're able to review our year. So check this out. 2020 in review, there were three predominant things. And here's what they are. Number one, there's a life group, or as we learn in other contexts, there's different names for that, small groups, churches that had a strong base of small groups actually were able to see some, some ministry go forward in strength in 2020. And you know what? We have, we have taught you this for many years now, that we need the large gathering, but equally as much, we need the small gathering. You need to be together in worship like you are today, but you also need the place in which you can go and be vulnerable and transparent and grow in friendship and what we would call, from a biblical standpoint, be discipled and, and share in, in your pursuit to follow Jesus together. And we had that. We still have that. We have over 30 life groups that, that meet regularly at Central Life across the entire Space Coast. The second thing that was, was a, a common denominator in, in improving and growing strength in 2020 was a technology application. That churches who were able to pivot quickly and utilize technology to serve and to minister and to connect people. And I'll tell you what, we were privileged to be in that position. We were used to recording our weekend services and putting them on an archive for all the church family and to use those in creative ways. But not only that, we had an infrastructure of technology that we used to communicate in a variety of ways, from social media to uh, a back-end uh, databases that we could send emails and all, all these things were in place. And so when we couldn't physically gather, we knew we could still communicate and connect and stay in touch and even worship together in our homes. And we did for 12 weeks in a row. We did not meet and we pivoted quickly. And I'll tell you what, what, what's worth celebrating is that now some 40 weeks after the fact, we have, we have been able to, as, as a church leadership, our team, I, you should love on your production teams on the Dream Team. You should love on the church staff because they did an amazing job of producing worship environments online for the last 40 plus weeks. And we have no, no, we have no idea or no deadline to that. We are pushing forward. We are moving into that with even greater efficiency. And man, I'll tell you what, if you're watching online today, we love you. We are not thinking about just the people in this space directly in front of me today or at our Oceanside location. We are thinking about all of you who are there at home or you're on the road or you're joining us from outside the Space Coast area. We love you. We are honored to do life with you and to do church with you. And it is a pleasure. And so church family, can we just one time, we just everywhere. Let's thank our online family for being a part of, of Central Life. We're so glad to be with you. The last one is this. It's financial margin. He said to me, you know what? In the dozens of churches I work with across the country, those who are thriving, they, they may not have had uh, bank accounts that were extravagantly full, but they lived with intentional margin before there was ever a crisis or a closure of campuses or anything like that. And because of that, they were able to look forward and say, how can we use what God has given us wisely and steward well? And when you put all three of these things together, what happens is, is that you realize it doesn't really matter what goes on outside externally of a ministry in a church. What matters is that we still have a mission we still have a calling. We still have, and you know what? God didn't say to us, his grace is sufficient for no reason. He said, my grace is sufficient. It comes, it literally means at the exact moment you need it, I give you what you need. And your grace, grace covers over this. And, and so these are all healthy things in our life. In fact, I just want to give you a little insight because we didn't get to share and celebrate some of the things yet, but I want to share some things about your generosity and how it's made an impact in 2020 and beyond. It will impact the year ahead. Take a look at this, a financial review for you, is that our revenue in 2020 was $1,193,000. And I want, you to, I want you to understand something about that. That is the highest amount of generous giving and income our church has ever experienced in its history in a single year. 
Praise God for that. He is faithful and your obedience to him to tithe and to give is actually producing health and allowing us to do ministry um, even better than we've ever done it. And so praise God for that. Our expenses in 2020 were 1039000 And what that leaves us with is a net, a net income of $153,000 in 2020. And added to our already having margin and, and some reserves, we end the year with $375,000 in reserves. That, my friends and, and church family, is the faithfulness of God through our lives is what it is. He has positioned and postured our church for more ministry, for more ministry. And so I want you to understand, I've told you that we operate on a minimum of 10% margin. And, and that this year has been true to that as it has been for the last seven years. 10% margin, minimally. And I want you to know, here's how that breaks down. If you can follow this with me, we have five major categories in our expenses and, and how we budget. And we have an operational cost, 25% of our expenses were attributed to that this year. Um, and our personnel cost, our staff and the families that, we, we, that lead our church, there's a cost of 33%. Our ministry environments that, that are strictly the things that we do to minister in and through the church, 18%. Our strategic partners, our missions partners around the world, we were able to invest 11%. Can I tell you, $130,000 went invested into partners locally and globally around the, year, around the world in 2020. The highest number of a dollar amount of investment ever. Praise God for that. In our reserves this year, we were able to uh, actually set aside 13% of every dollar that you gave went into reserves this year to posture to business. You know why? We have great plans for our future. And we don't want to just operate well with what we have. We want to prepare well for what's coming next. And we'll continue to do that. We have a lot of initiatives. You're going to learn, uh, you're going to meet some church planters in a few weeks. And we're going to give our first investment to church planting. It is going to be the greatest year of church planting that Central Life has ever had, 2021. You're going to meet three families. I'll tell you where they're coming to our praise party on the 29th. Don't miss it. Don't miss it. Either be in the room or be with us online. We'll be live streaming that whole event. We are going to bless those families. We're going to invest some dollars in them. We're going to pray over them. We're going to commission them and send them to plant churches. It's going to be an amazing, amazing time. There's, there's a whole, I could keep going. There's all these initiatives we're working on. We have, we are already beginning to exercise a plan for student ministry and children's ministry this year. That is new things that, that we believe are going to bring health to our families. We have a church um, building project that we are in the very early stages of planning and preparing for. I can't wait to tell you more about that, but I want you to know it's going to happen. We're going to build a new facility at our Cocoa West location that doesn't just serve our, our, our campus here. It will serve and resource our Oceanside location. It will serve the city of Cocoa and the surrounding cities. It will serve and minister to, to places we've not been yet with technology in mind. And so these are great things that, that we're planning and preparing for. Let me celebrate a couple more things and we're gonna open God's word together, okay? Look at this here. Um, our legacy offering, so excited to tell you this. 2019 was 102,000. And the last time I talked to you, we were at $86,000 in December had been given through, through our legacy offering. And, and from, from that point at mid-December through Christmas, you gave a little bit more and we hit $112,000 by year's end. Can we just celebrate that right now? Praise God for that. That's a sacrificial gift of, of just saying, you know where that's going? To our future. It's going to those initiatives that I just talked to you about a moment ago. And in 2020, I cannot overlook this. It was, it was probably my favorite moment of the year. And that's kind of strange because we didn't meet physically. But for 12 weeks, we created drive-throughs at our locations. And we began to bless our cities with food. Children who were needing food that were get, they previously received that when they went to school. There were families that lost jobs and the need for food in our communities doubled through our strategic partners. So our, our Brevard Sharing Center, they said, we need twice as much as we normally have. 
And you know what happened is after about five weeks of giving food to Brevard Sharing Center, one of the staff, one of the staff was asked by the director, hey, he, he was in charge of the inventory of food. He said, how, how much food or how much money do we need to allocate this week for food purchases? And they were, they were scrambling. They were buying double the amount of food they normally do. And you know what he said? Hey, if that church, Central Life, shows up again, we, we don't need to spend any money on food. We can allocate all that we have to our other initiatives to help homeless people get showers and to pay utility bills and bless people who are having hardship. How awesome is that? And then it continued 12 more weeks. You gave 10 tons of food in a 12 week period of time. And you know what I believe? I believe that that is an internal investment, although it was very practical in nature, to build inroads of love, support, and community. It was a sermon to our cities about the gospel of Jesus Christ. And church, I want you to know, 2020 was strange and it was weird and it was difficult for many reasons. But the ministry and the gospel of Jesus Christ did not cease at Central Life Church. It continued to go and it will continue to thrive. And I just want to say, whether you're here in this room or you're at Oceanside today or you're joining us online, can we just praise God one more time and say, thank you, Jesus, for 2020 and all that you did through our lives. And so today I want to transition into this sermon with all that in mind and tell you it's time to build. It's time to build. And some of you go, are we going to talk about the building? No, I'm going to talk about the people of God. I'm going to talk about the church, the house of God that is defined by the family of God. It is time to build the body of Christ. You know what the scriptures teach us through the book of Ephesians is that we are to edify the body of Christ. We are to build it up, take our gifts, our talents, our energy, our dollars, and we are to build the body of Christ. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. Really, the promise of the body and the church began in Matthew 16 when Jesus said this to his disciples. I tell you that you are Peter. He's having a conversation with them. And the promise comes out this way. On this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. They will not overcome it. And Jesus was in a dialogue with Peter about his name. And Peter, this means little rock. And Jesus is the rock, the sure rock. And, and he was saying, this faith that you have in me, this declaration that you believe I'm the Messiah is what he's talking about. He says, this is the rock in which I will build my church. I want to give you a little context for this. If you go and read Matthew 16, Jesus had taken his disciples on a little journey. They were going from the Galilee up to a city called Caesarea Philippi. There's another Caesarea on the Mediterranean on the coast, but there was, a, there was another city that carried the name Caesarea Philippi. It was actually the Greeks who established that city. And then when the Roman Empire came, Herod the Great dedicated that city as a, as a way of honoring Caesar. He dedicated it to Caesar and he built a temple there, a temple for Caesar Augustus, the temple of Augustus. And he had built three of those through the nation in his lifetime. And this was a, it became a prominent city as a result. Now, a little interesting fact about that city is it's about 20 miles north. It's at the base of Mount Hermon. And Jesus is climbing up this mountainside. He's getting to this spot and he's dialoguing with his disciples and this promise comes out. But what you got to know about this city is that founded by the Greeks and the Romans, it became a place of worship. And I got to tell you, it was the most bizarre worship you could ever read about. It was so Awful. The, 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 physical, the physical side of that city was that there was, a, there was actually a spring there that, that eventually got connected to uh, the Jordan River. But there was this natural spring so they could build life around it. And there was this cliff side. It was about 100 feet high, 500 feet wide. And there in the center of it was this opening, this big opening. It's referred to as a cave. But, it, but think more of like a hole in the ground is what it is like. And, and I've had the pleasure of actually being there multiple times, walked that, that ground and looked at this place and all along the side of the entrance of this cave that, that, that went down. And it was, it was covered in a Greek writing and Roman writing and architecture. And it was a, they made a temple out of this and the centerpiece was this opening in the cliffside. 
The opening went so far that they could not, they didn't know the depth of it. They would throw things in it. Um, uh, historians say that they would take, Josephus said that they could lower down rope. They couldn't lower rope long enough to figure out how far and how deep this hole actually was. And what they decided and what they declared was that this was the gateway to the underworld, which, which literally then was called, was called the gate of Hades. This is the, the, the gate, you've heard it said, you've heard this promise said, maybe you know this scripture that says, and the gates of hell will not overcome it. And, and what it's literally talking about is this spot, this physical location where Jesus said, I just want you to know that, that the worship that takes place there and the darkness that's being done there and the conclusions that have been made about this place and its power, none of that will ever stop me from building my church from building my church. And I want you to know, you know, when Jesus said the gates of Hades or the gates of hell won't prevail, hell has no power right. over you. But I, I need you to think about this for a minute and, and just, just come to this, this realization today. That hell in our society um, is viewed because of, because of some misunderstanding and some misinterpretation that, that hell is like some kind of thing where um, Satan and all of his gang of demons kind of plans and schemes from. Like it's their home. Like they're all hanging out there and, and they all come out of there and they just do their damage and they, you know, they, they impart harm on, onto humanity from a place of hell. And Satan must have a throne there and kind of rule from there. And I just want you to understand something, okay? That, that, that Jesus wasn't talking about hell he, in terms of what God has created as an eternal punishment. He was talking about that, that spot in that city called Caesarea Philippi and all that it represented in its satanic worship and saying that will not prevail. But hell doesn't have power. You know, where, you know what's going to happen to Satan? Is one day Satan will go to the literal hell that God has has created as a punishment of eternal separation and Satan will not rule from hell. He will be tormented in hell. He will be tormented and punished in hell for his rebellion against God like anyone else who decides to choose to pay for their own sin. You need to have that understanding today and realize that Jesus was talking about a physical place on earth when he said this that represented some of the most dark and wicked lifestyle in all of Israel may be the pinnacle of that in his day. In fact, rabbis, they forbid their followers to go to Caesarea Philippi. If Caesarea Philippi was placed in modern day America, it would be like those, it would be like uh, the advertisements you hear about Las Vegas. What happens in Las Vegas stays in Las Vegas. You know what I'm saying? Like that's the kind of place it was. In fact, it is a whole lot worse if you can imagine it. You know why? Because the Greeks, they had all these gods and they, they had declared that, that one of their gods, a god named Pan, P-A-N, that he lived and resided there in that city. And they worshiped him there. And he, was, he, he is the god of lust and sex and bestiality. And I, I just, that's all I really have to tell you to help you, help you understand what was taking place in that city. And, and it wasn't taking place as just a pleasure of life. It was taking place as worship. They worshiped with sex and lust and bestiality. They sacrificed not only animals, but children in that place. This is a place where if you, if, if you have a heart and your heart is broken for sexual abuse and sexual trafficking in our world today, I just want you to know that it's ancient places like Caesarea Philippi, in which it was originally glorified and held high and, and, and aspired after. And Jesus went to that place. He went to that place and he said, I want you to know something. You boys, you men who are following me, I want you to understand I'm building a people. This is the word ecclesia. I'm building a people, church, ecclesia, and nothing will stop it from being built. Nothing. And you know what you need to see in this statement is that Jesus declared, I. I will. Not you will. Not we will. 
But Jesus said, I will build my church. And then you know what he spent his time doing? Preparing those disciples to hand off his will to them and say, you're invited to participate with me. And his last command to them was, go. Go and make disciples. Go to every nation. We're going to go build the church out of all peoples across all the world. It's not going to stop here. It started here in Israel, but it didn't stop in here. It's going all over. And 2,000 years later, here you are. The living, breathing testimony of the promise of Jesus standing at the foot of Caesarea Philippi saying nothing's going to stop it. Nothing will ever stop it. I just want you to know that the Jesus that you love, the Jesus that you adore, the Jesus that you, you believe is majestic and beautiful, and he is, and the one that you worship, he stood and drew a line in the sand and said, there's not a single sin or a single Satan or demon that could ever stop what I am going to do. And if you feel as though, if you feel as though, wow, we're living, can you come now into your context? Wow, we're living in dark days. Jesus has been there. And Jesus is here. If some of you today would say, I just, I know that I believe God. You know what I think has happened to the church? If I can just explain it to you. I think the church has reached a place where that some of us are going, I don't know what to think anymore. I don't know what to think about what's going on in society and sin and darkness and people and just the decisions being made and we're moving in this direction politically. And I don't know what, and I think Christians are almost numb to like, what do we do? And I want to, I want to say to you, it's time to wake up church. It's time to wake up. We are building with the builder. We're building with Jesus Christ something that's not of this world and nothing in this world can stand against it. And Jesus, what, this isn't the first time that God promised this. God's been saying this to us for thousands of years. I've been meditating on this scripture all week long in preparation. I got to show it to you. Isaiah in the Old Testament. See if this sounds familiar to Matthew 16. God says through Isaiah. And, it, and by the way, it, go read the whole passage. This is a very unsettled time for the nation of Israel. It's like, oh gosh, what's happening to us? Kind of sound familiar? And Isaiah says, so this is what the sovereign Lord says. See, I lay a stone in Zion and a tested stone, a precious cornerstone for a sure foundation. And the one who relies on it will never be stricken with panic. This is a call to hope. This is, this is you and I declaring today, we have a foundation that's already been laid. We're not trying to lay one. We're adding to what has been already set for us. And we are building with our builder, the house of God, the people of God, for a great and significant purpose to see the family of God grow and heaven be filled. Today is a difficult day for a lot of reasons but it will never overshadow the fact that our purpose could never be removed, ever, because we have a sure foundation and a builder who's made a promise. So what is my, what's my response? You say, okay, pastor, you're getting pretty fired up today. I hope you're fired up. I hope you're ready. I hope Oceanside, I hope you're getting excited about something today. And that is there's a greater narrative going on in your life beyond, beyond what you see on this earth. I'm not telling you to disconnect from it and be disassociated from it. I'm trying to compel you to run to it like Jesus did and say, that's some messed up stuff. But the kingdom of God will prevail and I will show you, I will show you how to live a purpose fulfilled life in the midst of what's going on around you. So how do I do it? The question is, what's the response? What's the response? I want to take you to one other place in the scriptures, and I, I think it speaks for itself. I, I would tell you, I think the scripture does the heavy lifting. So, so just take this in and apply it with all that we've said so far. John chapter 19, Jesus has died. He's hanging on a cross. And I'll tell you what, that's the worst day of your life. That's the most uncertain day of your life. That's the darkest day you have ever experienced. And you go, I wasn't even there. Yeah, but that Friday evening and that Saturday until Sunday showed up, that was the darkest, most uncertain and difficult day of your life. If you can, if you can accept that in faith to go with the son of God dead, there is no hope. But I want to take you to two disciples right here in this text in John 19 who show you how to respond in dark days. 
And here's what they did. It says later, Joseph of Arimathea. Joseph, we find out in other gospel texts, he was affluent. He was wealthy. We find out that he was a respected councilman among the Sanhedrin. And it says this, he asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. He, he's looking at the cross and, he's, and he determines he's a follower of Jesus. And we find out here, even in this text, in secret. And he looks at the body of Christ. Can you imagine this? The disciples have fled. We learn that John stood at the foot of the cross with Mary, but everybody else has run. And Joseph is looking at that cross. And you know what he, declared, you know what he decides in his, in his mind? He says, I think I'm going to go to Pilate and I'm going to ask for that body. I mean, that's a bold move. That, that, that you don't just, I mean, that's Joseph associating with the criminal who just died is what that is in that context. And, and he's, he's going there and it says, Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly because he feared the Jewish leaders. He was well respected. He had affluence, but he was kind of keeping his fellowship of Jesus on the down low. You know what I'm saying? But not this day. This day he went to Pilate and he said, would you grant me the permission to take the body of Christ off that cross? And it says this, with Pilate's permission, he came and took the body away. Look at this, verse 39. It says, he was accompanied by Nicodemus. Do you know who that guy is? If you don't know, you're about to know. The man who earlier had visited Jesus at night. Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes about 75 Pounds. Now, listen, Nicodemus, that visit at night, John chapter 3. You know what is, you know what's famous in the book of John chapter 3? Verse 16, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only, that whoever would believe in him would have eternal life. And Nicodemus is the person that Jesus looked eyeball to eyeball with, knee to knee with across the table and said those words. Nicodemus heard those words out of the Messiah, the builder of the ecclesia, the people of God. He, he was the person who sat at the table and heard it straight out of Jesus's mouth. Oh, I've read it and I've heard it. But wow, I long for the day that I see the face of Jesus speak that to me like he did Nicodemus. And it changed his life. He did it in secret too, but it changed his life. You know, Nicodemus was a Pharisee and Pharisees don't participate in handling dead bodies. But Nicodemus showed up with 75 pounds of stuff to prepare the body of Christ for burial. Do you know what you do in dark days? You do that. You show up. And you do what no one else is really willing to do. And you care for the body of Christ. Here's the next thing. It says in verse 40, taking Jesus' body, the two of them wrapped it with the spices and strips of linen. And when I read that, I think these two guys, based on their status and position, we can confidently say, have never buried a body before. And now they have the body of the person they believe to be their spiritual leader and the Messiah of the nation of Israel. Can you imagine how many things they didn't know how to do? <laughs> By experience, they have none. They don't, but they did it anyway. They got in the midst of that anyway, and they began to prepare the body of Christ. This was in accordance with Jewish burial customs. In verse 41, it says, At the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. And, and many scholars associate this new tomb as something that had some... Joseph had some ownership over. And it says that because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. They laid him there. You know what that means? They had to hurry. This wasn't like a, oh, we got all the time in the world. We need to get this done because we have other obligations. We got to move on. And we're doing this in secret. And there was an urgency is what I'm saying to you about what they were doing. We need the body. We need to prepare it. We need to get it to the spot it needs to go so that, that this can be done peacefully. And, and what, out of what motivation does that come? And how does that speak to your life? I want to give you three words today that I see in this text that I think answer the question, how should we respond in difficult and dark days that are seemingly hopeless? And, and maybe it could become the motivation for how we move and act and think 
in the year to come. And here's what it is. It's time to build people. And here's how you build the church of God with Jesus. You appeal. You appeal. It says that Joseph went to Pilate, not out of rebellion and not in secret uh, did he try to take the body of Jesus, that he went to the authority. He went, you know, he went to, he went to the human authority that was actually responsible for allowing the crucifixion to take place. The one who gave his seal of approval and said, all right, fine, go for it, do it, kill him. And he went to that man and he appealed to him. And he said, would you allow me and give me permission to take the body of Jesus? And can I tell you, church, maybe that's the word that, that the Holy Spirit wants to speak to you today. Maybe the word that he wants to share with you is this. You need to appeal to me the authority of heaven over the body of Christ. You need to appeal. Do you know what that means? That means that we need to pray. That means that we need to get on our knees. That means I would, I would just, I would love for you to join us tomorrow in prayer, whether in the room or online, and get on your knees and just appeal to heaven and say, heaven, God, Father, Jesus, we need your body here. We need it here. We don't need to wait for something else. We don't need to, another decision to be made in our world. We don't need things to get darker or even brighter by the world's standards. We need the body of Christ. We need it. God, would you bless us with the body of Christ strong and powerful in this season on the space coast right here. We have to learn how to appeal to the authority of heaven. And to ask for the body of Christ. The second is, we have to care for it. Can I just tell you, there, there is no way around this. You have to be someone who has careful concern for the body of Christ. And you know what that means? You have to prioritize it. It has to matter to you. It's not a service you attend. It's a people that you're helping to build. And you can only do that carefully. And you can only do that with concern. And Nicodemus, can you imagine? The Pharisee walking in with the spices to perform the burial preparation. Never done it in his life. Some of us have got to lose this self-preservation attitude that we carry that, well, I'm just kind of here and it's good and I need to be a part. And you need to take ownership with careful concern of the body of Christ and you need to begin to care for it. You need to serve. You need to use your gifts. You need, it's, and can I tell you something? It'll cost you something to do this. This doesn't come free. We don't know, we can't prove for a fact that Nicodemus was married, he was a Pharisee, and there's a lot of scholars who believe he may have. And I was reading about that, I was thinking about that, and I thought, what did his wife think about his expenditure that evening of 75 pounds of goods to prepare the body of Christ? Maybe she was right there with him. Maybe she thought, this needs to happen. It costs something. You know what? It's not just a monetary thing. It could have cost him his entire reputation and his position and his livelihood and everything that he had built his life on that God thought he had, that he thought God had called him to. But he went and he cared for it. That means you care. You care about what it looks like. You care about its cleanliness. You care about the people. You care about the hearts. You care. Maybe that's what God's saying to you. The Third is this, and I think it, this is, is equally as powerful as the first two, is there's a place for the body of Christ when we prepare one. We need to prepare a place for the body of Christ. That means we never stop dreaming. That means we never stop making room. That means we never settle with where we are. It means this body can't just lay here it can't just be what it is today. It needs a proper place. And you know what I think will happen is, is that as you cultivate the ground and as we prepare our physical properties and here at Coco and Oceanside and more that maybe God has for us, I'm telling you, we need, we need places carved out of, <laughs> of limestone. Carved out of limestone is where they, they, they did that in Jerusalem. And they placed the body of Jesus there. And can I, I just want to appeal to you this way today. These three things build the body of Christ. You say, how? That was just preparing it for death. No, no, no. These things are the things that God does to build. He calls us to appeal. He calls us to care. He calls us to 
create some space and, and find a place for the body of Christ. And do you know what happens when, that, when those three things occur? Do you know what happens? Sunday morning comes and resurrection happens is what happens. That is what happens when the builders build. The body doesn't stay there, it comes alive. It comes out of that place and it goes into the cities. In fact, did you know that when Jesus died and he was prepared through this appeal and this care and this place he was laid, do you know that when he got up and walked out of there alive, it says that the tombs of the saints in Jerusalem opened up and they walked out into the city and they began to fill the streets and people were in awe of what was going on. God calls on you and I to build so that resurrection can happen in the city that he places in. And that's what we're after. We're after that fulfillment. And we're holding to a promise that is a sure foundation from Jesus himself who said, I just want you to know, no matter how dark it gets, how difficult it gets, how depraved it gets, how out of control it feels to you. <laughs> The most uncertain moment in all of life has already happened. I was dead, but now I'm alive and I will build my church. I will build my church. And I just want you to know, Central Life, we're, pu we're putting all our eggs in that basket, baby. We're going all in. We will build the church the way that God has called us to build called us to build. I want you to stand to your feet today and I want to pray for you. I want to, I want to speak a blessing over your life and maybe it's a, a great summary to all of this. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes in this moment. I just want to pray this for you. Just take these words in. It's in, the, it's in the book of Jeremiah, the prophet Jeremiah, who speaks to the nation of Israel, which is a typecast of the church. He says, he says to the people of God, he says, I want you to pray for the peace and the prosperity of of the city that God has brought you to. It might not even be the place that ideally you wanted to be. In fact, for the nation of Israel at that time, it was exile. He said, seek the peace and the prosperity of that place. It may not be your place, but it's the place God intended for you to be. It may not be what you thought would be the best, but it is the place that God has you now. And I want you to seek the peace and the prosperity of that place. Central life, I pray that you would seek the peace and the prosperity of the cities that God has planted us in, that we would care about the city of Cocoa, that we would care about the city of Satellite Beach, that we would care about Merritt Island and Rockledge and Vieira and Palm Bay and Melbourne and all of the Space Coast, that we would seek its peace and prosperity because God speaks a promise to us through the prophet Jeremiah. And he says that when you do that and you pray that God would give you that city, you pray for that. Seek the peace and the prosperity of that city. That if it prospers, you too will prosper. And I believe with all of my heart that that's a related to the, the ultimate will that God is exerting across the earth today. That he began thousands of years ago to build a family, to grow heaven's population, and he's included us in it. So Heavenly Father, we pray now that you would bless us with the strength and the courage the boldness to appeal to you, to care for the church, and to continue to relentlessly pursue to create a space and a place for it to thrive and to grow and overflow into the cities that you've planted us in. May it be for your honor and for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you again, Pastor Ryan. You always bring us a faithful word. And here's what happens when God's word goes out. It comes into our heart, in our mind. We're, we're children of God and it speaks to us in an intimate way. And I trust that the Lord has challenged you perhaps today. Maybe it's caused a spirit of repentance, like, oh, I need forgiveness in a certain area of my life. Or maybe it's beginning a relationship with Jesus Christ. Maybe you have never had invited Jesus to come into your heart, to be the Lord of your life. Regardless of what that is, it all involves a next step for all of us. And that's the great thing about the way God works in our lives. He's always moving us forward. We recognize that and we know how important those steps are. And so we encourage you to communicate with us. You can use the connection card here on the screen. Tell us a little bit about what God's doing in your life and allow us to join you and help you, counsel with you, pray with you, whatever it might help you to take that next step. 
So keep that in mind. We love you very much here at Central Life Church. Our last act of worship is to acknowledge the fact that generosity brings freedom. God is a giver and he's taught us to be givers. And obviously we have clear instructions in the Bible of how to do that. And so many of you do that right here online and you give back a portion of what you've earned this week or this month. And we're grateful for that because you're accelerating the vision of Central Life Church when you do that. And so use the, the various ways you can mail a check in still here to 300 Tucker Lane. The address is on the screen and, and, and do it by mail or just do it online. But the point is this, God knows your heart and God wants us to respond to him in love. And he says he blesses a cheerful giver. We do it happily because we know that we're doing things of eternal value. So God bless you in your giving. Thank you for joining us today. And we look forward to having you right back again next week.